government is going to take a very important decision this week on whether or not uh, to ban Huawei's uh, 5G equipment uh, from the telecoms networks here in the country where I am at the moment. What kind of impact does this have on your HR and staffing operations? Uh, because the government's uh, you know, feelings about Huawei and the public opinion are very mixed. They are very mixed indeed and at the moment we are hopeful and we are confident um, and we have the support. What's more important to recognise is that um, we have not any evidence-based facts to support why 5G, um, a lot of reports as yet, we're to see that, that evidence and I know we're doing a lot to try to convince the government that we are secure, we are safe, we will not have any uh, backdoor um, activities, etc. But what's more important is that we also have the confidence and the trust of our customers are also trying to work and convince uh, the UK government that to strip Huawei out, and I think the plan is by 2029 to strip uh, Huawei um, out from all the, the networks, would actually be very detrimental, not only to our customers, but also the end user. Um, so I think this is a, a far bigger decision um, and I think Huawei still has a very important role to play. We can play an, an important role and we're already part of that, that system, that network. We've been in the UK now for 20 years. This year, 2020, is our 20th anniversary. So we've already had you know, the 2G, the 3G, the LTE, the 4G, the 5G. You can't just strip out 5G or not implement 5G because the impact will be so phenomenal. Um, it's not just that simple. So I think the complexities and how uh, it would be done and the effect, you know, some of our customers are already saying that there would be outage and blackouts for two days at a time. So I think it, it's it, obviously it's a very uh, crucial decision. Um, it's not a decision the UK government will take lightly. But I think uh, all factors need to be uh, considered. And we are very confident. So, for example, we are still uh, expanding, we are still growing, and we, we don't just have 5G technology. You know, we are uh, diversified now in three business groups. We have the consumer, which looks after uh, handsets, wearables, and uh, you know, audio uh, headsets, etc. Uh, and also, we have our enterprise business. Um, and the good news, um, as you may well have known, that recently uh, we got approved for a manufacturing site in Cambridge. So we will still look at ways to have a business, uh, to expand our business. So the, the government will make its ultimate decision, but that doesn't mean to say it's the end of Huawei. We are still very strong uh, in other areas. We will look at new opportunities. We will look at ways of expanding and growing as much as we can and if it means diversifying into more consumer, more um, uh, uh, manufacturing, research and development, we're very strong as well in the UK in research and development. So it may mean the landscape that we currently have today may change, but we will still maintain a very strong and high presence you know, in the UK and uh, across the rest of Europe. So we're, we're still recruiting, we're still growing on the local uh, employees, we're looking, we have a localization strategy of which I'm part of that team. Uh, we're 70% uh, hired locally. So we, at the moment, from an HR perspective, there is no change to that strategy. We will still move forward and let the geopolitical landscape, you know, take, take its place. And then we will adapt and adjust accordingly. But at the moment, we're still looking at growth very interesting because uh, there could be potential blackouts in the UK had they make a decision to remove Huawei. And so today we're not talking about the just eliminating possibly a vendor from the 5G networks in uh, the UK. They are possibly talking about uh, removing all the existing equipments from the 2G to the 4G horizon. How does that affect uh, you know, the telecommunications uh, uh, efficiency within the country? Okay, so I'm not a, a, a technical expert and I won't profess to be you know, technically competent, but my very layman basic understanding is that it will have a detrimental uh, impact in the quality, the service, 
uh, the capability of accessing you know people nowadays technology is embedded in our daily lives i mean the first thing everyone does when they wake up in the morning you know and they use their phone but to wake up set their daily uh, alarm is they check you know the news the media they want streaming they want downloading if you you know, go back and strip the layers of already the technology that Huawei has embedded in our customers' uh, networks and infrastructures over the last 20 years. Um, I think the impact cannot be uh, underestimated. And I think the end user will be the one that will suffer because at the moment, who's going to take the place? Who's going to be able to fill that gap? You know, from 5G, we are currently leading uh, I, I know many other companies are, you know, catching up and have 5G technology that they're developing. But at the moment, we have 90 5G contracts, 90 plus 5G contracts globally. Um, I'm not aware that anybody else has that. So I think the that impact will be huge. Huawei has been really at the center of the US-China trade war, and I call it US-China technology uh, war now. Um, you as a foreigner who has worked for a Chinese you know, company for 15 years, how do you observe and uh, how did you feel working for Huawei, given you know, the US um, sanctions and the boycott of uh, Huawei over the last uh, couple of uh, well, months and years? Uh, it's a good question. So as a, a personal, uh, you know, individual, uh, I am asked this by family, by friends, by colleagues. And I can say um, when when this all started, uh, for me, I've had a fantastic journey in Huawei. Uh, it's been a great company. Um, it supports a lot of uh, employees locally. Um, it was disappointing and it came as a bit of a shock. Uh, so for us, it, it came from nowhere. Suddenly, you know, business is booming, uh, growth is excellent. You know, we're looking at new domains, we're entering, you know, IoT, cloud, all of these areas. And then suddenly this hit us sort of left field. So it was very disappointing. And for me, a lot of the uh, reports and statements and rhetoric that was being expressed about Huawei was very damning and um, quite brutal. So, um, I have not witnessed any of that. I have not seen any of that. We're very open, we're very transparent. We look at collaborating with our customers, with our partners, uh, and we look to build a win-win ecosystem. So um, I think we will continue with that, with that uh, ethos and that uh, ambition. And I think we've got to let the wider geopolitical situation you know, play itself out. Meanwhile, we will maintain business as usual. We will keep uh, you know, performing, we will remain focused and dedicated, um, but it, it's out of our hands. Zhongfei owns, uh, according to some latest reports, 1.4% of Huawei, and the rest of the company's ownership are scattered amongst employees, uh, possibly tens of thousands. You know, not everyone who owns a share of the company actually is the boss of the company. So how much does that 1.4% of ownership by Mr. Nijelfe himself translate to his absolute control of the company, 100%? Okay, as, as you know, Mr. Nijelfe is the founder. So he, he is like the philosophical uh, influence that we have within the organization. But um, it is managed by three rotating uh, chairmen. Uh, that we have that do a six month uh, rotational uh, and they run the business, they operate the business, they um, you know collaborate with the regions and the countries. So Mr. Uh, Ren sits above um, and gives his sort of views, his opinion, his philosophy, his thinkings. And then we as a business try to interpret that where appropriate. Um, so yes, he's still a huge influence but from an operational day-to-day -day perspective, it's very much driven by um, a, our executive management team um, and then the uh, uh, rotating CEOs. So we all look to Mr. Wren as uh, being one of inspiration, one of motivation, but from a business perspective, it's very much managed by uh, the, the, CEO, the chairman, the three rotating chairmen. There is no doubt uh, that Mr. Ren 
is the heart and soul of Huawei. Uh, but just to be absolutely clear, he absolutely has the veto power on Huawei's board, doesn't he? In other words, if uh, he's so effectively making the most important decisions 100% at the helm of the organization. Oh, now, that's a very good question. And not having access or visibility or being able to attend such high-level uh, meetings within um, within Huawei. We have a uh, large governance body, I believe uh, is approximately 15 people, uh, of which sits the very senior from headquarters management of the organization. Now, how they operate within those board meetings and those committees, unfortunately, I don't have access to that uh, information. I, ha I don't have that level of detail. But certainly overseas, and as a local employee, we uh, see Mr. Wren as, uh, you know, the leader, the founder. Uh, we very much respect uh, his achievement and what he has achieved in just 33 years to where we are today. The exponential growth has been phenomenal. But how they would then structure the decision making and the veto power, I don't have that knowledge. So, let's be talking about uh, the corporate assets. Uh, uh, Huawei's uh, uh, stock, uh, employee stock sharing program is quite unique in its own way. According to Harvard Business Review, it says that uh, you know the normal uh, employee stock ownership programs that are offered for Western companies are considered as golden handcuffs. But Huawei's employee stock sharing program is a silver handcuff. What is the difference there? Um, I think what, what uh, the, the, the employee sh uh, share option scheme offers for uh, uh, Chinese employees is a way to be a part of the uh, organization. Um, it's all about performance. It's all about being the best that we can be uh, investing. As you know, we have 96,000 employees um, in, uh, working in R&D. That's just under 50% of uh, total uh, employee base. We also invest on average 10% each year uh, in research and development. So it's our company. So it's very much, you know, we've got to contribute. We want to reap the benefits, the reward. Then it's seen as a motivation. It's seen as a commitment from our side. It's not just something um, that you get for being an employee. You've been there five years, six years. This is all very much you are contributing to the growth and the success of the organization. So it's like everybody has a vested interest. You know, it's very important for them uh, to see while they uh, continue to succeed. And as you, you say, from the geopolitical environment, more about survival. You know, we have to survive uh, through this crisis, through this challenge. And the stock uh, plan is a way of recognizing that commitment, that hard work and dedication of, of the employee. So, I think from that perspective, it's very genuine because the dividends are not distributed to shareholders who have, you know, uh, you know, for many other organisations, shareholders, uh, they bought stock in the company, so they have uh, trust in the company, but they're not driving the business. They're not working each day, every day to help that business succeed. And I think that's the unique value of the Huawei scheme. Leslie, uh, the uh, biggest crisis we are facing right now is, of course, that pandemic and uh, every big company and small is of course uh, under extreme pressure. Now unemployment uh, stood at 7.4 percent, the unemployment rate in the euro area in June. A lot of the biggest companies like Nissan, Renault, Airbus, British Airways and so on are laying off their staff. Do you have to cut employees and staff at Huawei as well? At the moment, uh, where we are, if we think about it, uh, the pandemic uh, has been um, an awful situation uh, for uh, us uh, as a, a global uh, uh, um, world, um, and it's affected um, everybody. So now we are relying on digitalization. So now has come the need for you know the working from home, the technology, how we can be efficient, how we can diversify. So ever more so, we are needing technology. We are needing the networks not to fall down, not to crash, because people are uh, relying on uh, connectivity. So for Huawei, we are um, an ICT organization. We are driving digitalization um, and transformation in this uh, area. 
So we have to see, although it's a, a, an absolute terrible situation, it also brings opportunity. It's like everything, there, there is always opportunity. So for us at the moment, we uh, did not have to uh, furlough any staff. You know, many organizations, especially the retail industry, the hospitality industry, uh, you know, they're having to furlough many employees, make redundancies. Um, at, at the moment, uh, we're not in that, in, in that situation. Now, I can't predict if that won't come, um, but we're part of digital. So we believe we have a stronger um, uh, role to play uh, for our uh, customers. So hopefully we will not see uh, uh, a massive redundancy. There may be some restructuring and reorganization um, um, and that will be part of uh, you know, organizational efficiency that we look to do each year as we move from one business to another. But uh, as a massive redundancy program, um, um, uh, fortunately at this moment, no, we are not entering such, such a situation. And I hope that remains the case because it's gonna be very difficult for people to lose their jobs, you know, and find jobs, you know, the number of jobs uh, uh, on the market are reducing. So it's going to be very difficult if a person is made redundant to find alternative employment. Leslie, you talked about uh, this rotating chairman system within Huawei. As far as I know of, no other leading global companies does that. Why is that? Um, again, um, I'm not part of that decision-making um, power, but my understanding is that it keeps the organization agile and it keeps it fresh. So it's like many organizations will rely on uh, the leader's thinking and he may go a path, the route or she, um, and uh, they go down that path. And decisions may be based upon uh, personal preference, personal understanding. At Huawei, it's all about collective management. We all bear the responsibility. You know, it's our, it's our company, it's a private company. Therefore, it goes back to uh, the share scheme. So it avoids any uh, wrong decision. It keeps the ideas fresh. Um, and therefore, we can grow the success. That is my um, understanding. Um, and uh, I think it's actually a very good idea. I've worked in many organizations in the past, both British and American, um, where decisions have been made that have uh, perhaps been the wrong decision. Uh, but this, you've got three people. So uh, each person will bring its own value and have its own thinking and idea to make sure that we maintain any risk mitigation. Um, so I actually uh, welcome this rotating in CEO, this six month period, because it means things are moving forward. Nothing gets stuck. And I think in today's environment, uh, it's very dangerous to become complacent. Uh, one has to keep moving forward. Leslie, you have been working for Huawei for 15 years already. Currently, you're heading up uh, the uh, Human Resources Department, uh, or the VP there for Western Europe. Now, let's be honest, uh, Huawei for many Westerners is a very obscure company. It's such a huge, um, you know, elephant in the room uh, for many, and it's difficult to basically look behind the curtain, right? Um, so, um, you who are a foreigner working for the company, can you tell us a little bit more, offer some insight about the corporate culture, about the mechanisms, you know, how everything works, and maybe also gender diversity? Okay, so I think I think um, a lot of people, um, and I think you know, even if I take uh, my family and my friends, there is a lack of knowledge and a lack of understanding about what. Uh, there's a lot of media coverage that we report the negative. So the true story, uh, the true uh, the true Huawei as a foreigner and especially as a female working in Huawei. Um, is is the opposite. So I'm not saying um, it's not hardworking, it's not committed, it has a, a very strong Chinese culture. As long as you um, have an openness, flexibility, and you can push aside a lot of what you hear, you know, it's noise, it's noise in the background. Try to not let that noise um, and that negativity affect your decision. So for me, I can honestly say it provides opportunity and in Huawei, it's all about performance. So it doesn't matter, you know, what race, what gender, what ethnicity, it, it, it's irrelevant. 
if you can do the job and it doesn't matter if you're you know 20 30 40 50 it is all about capability competence contribution to the company so if you're prepared to do that then opportunities are boundless and i've seen people grow i've seen people come on board and yes it is not for everybody you know we're still headquartered in china so a lot of the decisions may be made in china but we have over the years given more authority you know we call it the front line so we can make the decisions here because we know the market we know our customers so we are, we have changed we are evolving we're still on a journey and as i talked about we have a localization strategy so we what we would like to see is uh, continue uh, you know the locally hired uh, employees and enable them better to uh, succeed within Huawei. So we're implementing new programs. We're looking at upskilling as we move, move to different domains. So if you're in the carrier uh, space and there is an opportunity to optimize, doesn't mean you go. We will look to move you to another area of business. So. Um, it provides opportunities, and I think that's, and we have the best technology, and I think that's what we have to look beyond. Um, at the moment, we continue to invest, we continue to build strong relationships with our customers, and we will continue to work with governments. Therefore, there is a, a, always a place uh, for good, uh, competent, capable employees. Leslie, I want to go back to the Huawei rotating chairman system. A, a business school. A graduate would probably ask the same question like I do. You have uh, when you have three rotating chairmen, that adds a lot of uh, additional cost in terms of uh, running the institution because you add a lot of uh, communication costs, a lot of admin costs, and uh, not exactly everybody think alike, right? No matter how closely they work together. Um, no one knows how I think about the world and the company as much as I do myself. And so how do you maintain the level, a strong level of efficiency to uh, communicate the message and transpire the corporate vision across three people rather than just having one? And at the same time, you know, let's face it, I mean, everybody has uh, preferred employees that they like to work with. And so all these three rotating chairmen, so how do they ensure that they work with exactly, you know, the same unified team at the very same level with the same style of management? So that, that is a very good question. And that's one of the things I very much uh, admire from the rotating CEOs. It goes back to my previous comment about performance. It is all about the right person in the right job performing at the best they can be. So whether, um, you know, Shirley, you like me, Martina, you know, likes me, doesn't like me. It's irrelevant. I'm doing my job. I'm performing at the best. So this rotating CEO avoids such situations where we have any favoritism, any nepotism. Um, it gets away from that because it, it's all about giving employees the opportunity. If you can do that job and you contribute and show your value to the organization, and um, that's the key. And I think that's what's good about about the rotating CEOs. They will put in place the right people uh, to do uh, and grow the business in whichever whichever domain. So uh, with regards to efficiency, I think the communication and uh, the, the relationship uh, among the three uh, CEOs um, and how they communicate, how they collaborate is very tight, is very strong. So it's not to say that there is a handover period. Everybody is fully aware of the situation timely. So it's not to say I take it over and, oh, my God, I need two weeks to catch up, uh, become familiar with what's going on. They know exactly timely what is going on. It's a little bit like the uh, Swiss uh, government uh, system as well, where you have seven presidents uh, and each of them is in charge of uh, one department. Um, so the efficiency definitely is there. I wanted to ask you also, you're leading the uh, Huawei corporate um, globalization uh, campaign and uh, initiative. So what is Huawei's grand vision, you know, over the next uh, five uh, to 10 years? Are you planning to take over the world? <laughs> so you give me high praise. So uh, just to, just to put it uh, uh, just to correct slightly here, um, I'm not looking at globalization. I am looking for Western European region. 
I'm looking at uh, our localization strategy. Now that localization strategy is linked to a global strategy. So there is a team in headquarters that would look at that global strategy. So I then need that's cascaded down to me uh, for a European level. So we have to look at uh, how we can enable more going back to how challenging, how difficult it, it is for you know, a local employee to truly a, embed themselves into Huawei, understand the strong culture, and then contribute and do, do a good job. So uh, I'm responsible for uh, putting in place programs that we can, we can enable that. So it's all about, you know, we bring on board the talent and that will be young talent, uh, high potentials for the future, uh, senior experts uh, that we need. So it will be across all the board. And then we develop that talent. We also make sure that we incentivize um, that talent. So we have to look at ways uh, to uh, retain our local employees. So um, as you may well know, we uh, local employees cannot uh, participate in the uh, share scheme, employee share option scheme, but we have a local um, alternative that we call TUP, which is a, a target unit plan fixed for five years and basically a deferred bonus. So again, we're looking at ways to level the playing field. So it's not Chinese employees, it's not local employees, we're just Huawei employees that are here to support, contribute to the company. And then if we are successful, then we can uh, you know, benefit from, from uh, the rewards from that and achieve the, the recognition. And then also look at how we can bridge you know, the cultural uh, differences. So uh, globally, you know, we have, I think it's uh, 170 nationalities working for Huawei. And within the Western European region, we have 70 nationalities. So not only do we have the cross-culture differences from the Chinese to the locals, we also have it, you know, from the French to the German to the Spanish. You know, we also have that complexity. So my team is also looking at ways that we can, you know, we can bridge that cultural divide. So it's a very interesting time. Um, and for employees to be part of Huawei now, it is a time of transformation within this region. So um, we're, we're implementing some exciting uh, initiatives. So that, that's, that's kind of in a summary, uh, my responsibility. Talking about uh, this uh, culture of survival, Huawei has a very strong sense of this, uh, uh, what we call in Chinese, uh, the wolf's culture. And so, you know, yes. a very crisis-minded, uh, you know, constantly looking for solutions and looking for uh, competitive advantage. And so even uh, Mr. Ren, as he took on media sometime in 2019, he said at the top of the global technological zenith, there can be only one um, within Huawei. Is it acceptable to talk about even being number two? Um, we mustn't. We mustn't be, uh, you know, aggressive, and we must always remain humble. But at the end of the day, every company wants to be the best it can be, and our ambition um, is to be number one. Is to be that trusted uh, provider, supplier, vendor uh, to to every uh, opportunity. You know, be it in uh, you know the, the carrier space, the enterprise space, the consumer space. So everybody wants to be the best that they can be. And we believe that with the investment, with the technological advantages uh, that we have and the way we operate um, our organization, that, that you know, we can be number one. So it's a good ambition and we can all strive for that. So we try to deliver that message to our employees to let them know they're part of something big. Um, you know, we have this ambition. We want to be here for the long term. We just don't want to play, you know, low hanging fruit. We truly want to be part of uh, the ecosystem. Yes, when, when we talk about uh, Amazon, I guess at the very beginning, they also aspire to be global number one as well, but they never talked about it as deliberately as a corporate culture, as a, a, you know, to the extent that Huawei does. To what extent do you think this uh, culture of survival, this uh, wolf culture, you know, to be global number one, uh, is understood or misunderstood by the rest of the world, and that certainly, uh, you know, you know, to some extent, uh, does that sound fear? It's a good question, and I think from an external perspective, I do think it, it, it is misunderstood. Um, it comes across as being uh, perhaps slightly arrogant, um, 
you know, we will succeed no matter what, whatever the consequences, we're going to make sure we're number one. Uh, but internally, it is not like that. We are taught and told constantly, and even uh, many Mr. Wren's uh, speeches, talks about being humble, talks about making sure we are not arrogant with the customer. We are looking at ways of partnering, you know, with uh, health authorities, with education authorities, with our partners, with our customers, with governments in order that we can have a win-win, a mutual win-win situation using our technology, uh, using our solutions. Uh, so internally, it's, it's, it's different compared to the market. However, from an employee perspective, yes, it is all about a healthy, competitive environment because we all want to be the best and we're all competing against each other. So that wolf culture, you know, uh, comes a part of it. And we do uh, teach that with uh, in our new employee orientation program. We try to touch upon that. Obviously, we can't go too deep because I think you need to be in Huawei to truly understand and witness that year on year. But I do think uh, there is a slight misunderstanding. However, it does it does exist. That's very interesting. Uh, the, hypothetically, I guess, you know, a person is born with that genetic competition to, to be competitive. Uh, can you teach work culture to employees or perhaps even in the uh, selection process, you are specifically looking for these uh, personality traits? So to recruit for the wolf culture uh, would practically be uh, impossible, and I'm sure, not sure how one would do that. But we have competency uh, interview questions, and each business domain, each hiring department will be looking for a certain skill set, a certain type of person that they want to, uh, that meets their business requirements. There's not, within Huawei, what I like is there's not one size fits all. So there is flexibility, there is adaptability, and there's kind of an interpretation of what we need when we need it. But managers and hiring managers have that, that flexibility. What we want, we want people um, uh, to come on board that uh, have a willingness, have a passion, have a desire to be part of uh, uh, Huawei, to be part of this and open to this Chinese culture, but also to perform, to contribute, to show their value. And that's where we have all the mechanisms and the programs that will identify these people, will fast track these people, will give these people more opportunity. And that's what we say, if you can fulfill on these requirements, then you will have greater opportunities. And, and for me, from an HR perspective, we want to motivate people, we want to inspire people. And all managers, it's their duty to get the best performance out of their employees and teams. It's not just individual, very much uh, team teamwork. So um, I, I actually like this. You know exactly where you are. You know exactly what, what's expected of you. Um, and if you want to be successful, the platform is there. Knowing quite a number of uh, Huawei employees, uh, Leslie, I've noticed that the company is really trying to do like a 50-50 share in each country that you operate in with uh, hiring domestically and then also getting uh, Chinese talents uh, on board. So I guess uh, there needs to be a very good uh, mix and match and more cultural uh, exchange and so on. Uh, the last question from my side, Leslie, is about the future of work. Now the pandemic, COVID-19, has disrupted so many um, work models, obviously. I was wondering how you in Western Europe are planning to implement new work models, working from home, flexible working hours, etc. Okay, so you're right. Um, everyone's been affected, you know, and nobody yet knows uh, what the new normal um, will be. So we're looking at the moment, uh, most of our offices still have the working from home uh, policy. Uh, we're looking at uh, employee safety, welfare, uh, you know, well-being. Uh, some offices will slowly, as uh, the government dictates, will move back to 50% occupancy, and then we will slowly look at ways. Now, I don't have the answer yet. We're having a lot of discussion. Certainly, the advantage of Huawei has been, that, and that's one of the reasons we've uh, not needed to uh, lay off people. People immediately, you know, have their laptop, have their mobile phone. We have the connectivity. We have um, our own alternative to um, Zoom internally. So, for example, for three months, uh, I only came back this week. 
uh, for three months I was working from home in the UK, I could still communicate with my teams. Hopefully business was not impacted. And, and we also uh, implemented some training because for many people, this is a first time experience for this, this remote working. So we immediately put in place, you know, some training for, for managers, for employees on how, how to manage themselves. Uh, we put in place uh, welfare officers that if somebody is concerned or anxious about uh, things they can touch, reach somebody to uh, communicate this with. So we've put in place um, a lot of uh, solutions to cover this time. Now, what that will look like going forward, um, I, I don't know. Um, we're yet to have uh, those meetings, which we will have. And that's one of the reasons I'm now back in Dusseldorf, that we will start that dialogue. But what, what it's proven is it can be done. You know, flexible working, working from home. Um, you know, this is potentially the new norm. Um, but I don't, I don't know how we will uh, define that. But certainly uh, at the moment, people are still in that situation. Lastly, I read uh, from, again, uh, the Harvard Business School analysis on uh, Mr. Ren Zhongfei, and it says that uh, Mr. Ren is a uh, slow decision maker. And I think that's perhaps uh, contradictory to uh, many of the conventional beliefs of him because he's a quick thinker and he's very resolute and uh, decisive and strategic. Is he a slow decision maker? Again, uh, unfortunately, um, I have uh, met uh, Mr. Ren, but I've been in a huge meeting hall and, you know, he's been speaking and we've had um, translators because I worked in headquarters uh, in 2016 and 17. So I, I had the opportunity to meet him. However, I've not met him, you know, in a personal um, capacity. What I can say from a local level, um, as I talked about delegation of authority earlier, we can make our decisions and we make the decisions based on the requirements in our region. So each region will have its own president. Now, Mr. Wren makes the very big high level, you know, decisions, but day to day operations, uh, business as usual, uh, you know, how we design our strategy, that is all done locally. And that is very agile. Um, and, it, and that's one of the things. Huawei is a very dynamic, fast paced um, organization. Um, and we're evolving and we're uh, meeting you know, the changing environment rapidly. Otherwise, we will not determine our survival if we cannot keep pace with the changing external environment. And we can do that uh, in our country and in our region. And on this uh, survival culture, uh, a lot of the employees uh, that were hired in Shenzhen, the headquarters, when they come to the jobs, uh, they are given mattresses and blankets and so that they can sleep in the office in order to continue work. This is almost seen as a badge of honor for many employees working at Huawei. This is the golden standard of work ethics, I should say. Do you do that in Western Europe? No, we don't. But what I can say is, um, you know, the way to look at it, it's power napping. So uh, within the Chinese culture and in the Asian culture, that is very common. That is not just unique to Huawei. I'm aware from many other uh, companies that this power napping is also um, acceptable um, and, and uh, part of their daily behavior. So the first thing that happened to me when I uh, went to work in headquarters, my secretary said to me, oh, shall I order you a bed? And I said, that's very kind of you. But I'm not used to sleeping at lunchtime. It would it would feel very odd for me. Um, it's just not in our culture. We don't do that in Europe. But it was done in China. It was done in headquarters. And it was seen as very successful. It enabled people to have the energy, uh, you know, to uh, work through uh, the afternoon and um, tackle uh, what was uh, coming and facing them in the afternoon. I think, again, this goes back to culture. So no, we don't do that in Europe, uh, but I do understand why it is done. And after a while, you do, you, you do accept it. You have to be open. You know, cultural differences are not good and bad. They're just different. And um, part of working at Huawei is that we have to embrace, you know, the different cultures. And that's, that's one of the examples. Shirley, you're on mute. Let's see, uh, how much does AI play into uh, the future of HR selection process, particularly at Huawei? 
I think in the future, I think HR has to move to um, AI and technology. Uh, I'm on many forums and networks about HR, and we're always seen, you know, as the last, the last domain that follows and catches up. It's still very much human to human interaction, subjectivity. Uh, you know, uh, do you think somebody, uh, you know, is is a fit for the company? Again, how can you assess that? So we now have to move. Obviously, we have uh, data and data analytics that is all you know, uh, uh, system-based. Uh, but when it comes to sort of that human interactivity and making sure we select the right person, a person that will fit the culture, the AI has not taken that step yet. But I think over time, we will see more reliance on HR. And I think we also should see more reliance on HR. We, as human resource professionals, we need to catch up with the changing world and how ICT Will set the foundation for the future. One last question, uh, Leslie. Okay, so decision needs significance, obviously, for Western Europe, particularly for decisions in France and Germany, which are uh, imminent. What's likely to happen there? It's difficult for me to predict. I mean, we, we are hopeful, we are confident. Um, uh, we, we, we truly hope that uh, the right decisions will be made. We can continue to main, uh, remain uh, a strong business presence. We can continue to uh, work with our customers to make sure they're successful. They have the solutions fit for the future. So it, it, it's difficult to predict what will happen because it's outside of our control. We can do our best to uh, build up that relationships, allay fears. We are not a cybersecurity sure. risk. But we have to wait. We're playing a waiting game.